Welcome to Piney Grove. I'm Brad. I'm Deb. And we're out here on our 20 acres in Northwest Florida. This is video number three that we're putting together for y'all to show you how we developed our land out here in preparation for retirement in a few years. We're four years in at this point. We took a year to find some land and then we've been developing this piece of property for three years and the hope is that we'll retire a little bit early and go from that coastal life out here to the country life. Last time I checked, uh, three years into this, I've got uh, just me, I'm not counting Deb's time or uh, or anything like that, just my time when I'm working. But I have uh, pushing 900 hours in three years of being on this property, uh, chainsawing, um, tractor, excavator, mowing, picking up sticks, planting, uh, fertilizing, uh, spraying, just uh, doing all the things that it takes to get this raw land ready for us uh, when we're ready to retire in about three, three and a half years. So Deb likes to make fun of me that I that I like to stay busy, and, and it's very true. I um, I don't sleep much, and when I'm awake, I, I don't want to be sitting around. I want to be making progress towards something. Um, if it's cutting grass with scissors, that's fine with me, but I, I just don't want to be sitting around. I can't think of who said it, but it has been said that every minute spent outdoors is a minute that's not subtracted from your life, and I kind of believe that. No, Deb's was, not going to talk. I saw my train of thought. <laughs> oh, something bit me. Did it? Yeah you will not meet a harder working man you you just want what you see and what we've done and what we've created there have been a few things that we've had to get people to do you know build buildings but the set the sweat equity and the hard work that this man has in this property is is beyond anything i ever would have imagined and i've known him for years and i know he's hard working so deb's being very generous there she's been out here with me a bunch of times um i think i've darn near killed her a couple of times because it does get hot in Florida and humid and it just it just sucks the wind out of you. So today's video is going to be about how we created this pasture that's behind us. There was a lot of work that went involved after the bulldozers packed up and left and uh, it all started with a soil sample and I'm not going to sit stand here in front of you and act like the expert in uh, soil biology or things of that nature but the basics of a soil test is your pH level, and that's how acid your soil is. And you amend acidity in your soil by adding lime. So as I'm pointing out here on our soil samples, um, our soil was a little too acidic to grow Bahia grass or grow pasture grass for animals. So we had to amend it with lime. On soil samples, the, the primary thing you look at is the pH. Uh, that's the first thing you have to amend. The other three major nutrients are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and those are the three big numbers that are on a fertilizer bag. So um, this isn't a tutorial on fertilizer, but the biggest thing that I had to do after the land clearing was get that soil sample. So I sent it to University of Florida, got the results back, and then determined how much lime that the soil needed to make it more alkaline or more neutral so that it would release the nutrients in the soil so that we could grow this pasture and the other things that we grew behind us as we were trying to build up the organic matter in the soil. I didn't have a tiller at the time, and by a tiller, I mean a rototiller that goes behind the tractor. I had a disc harrow. Um, so I had to disc all of that behind me with a Kubota 38 horsepower tractor with a five foot disc. And it had to be like double and triple disc. You couldn't just go over it once. Um, a lot of sticks would get bound up in the disc. I had my son out here, as you see in the photos, and he started out just here behind me, maybe 50, 60 yards. And he had his headset on and he had her in gear and he had the foot to the to the pedal going as wide open as she'd go. And I could hear the tractor bogging down. So I told him, watch out for the sticks that get caught in the disc because the disc won't rotate and it'll basically create a plow behind you of impacted with sticks. So that's what we had to deal with. Uh, the bulldozer root rake went through, I box bladed. I went out there and uh, just picked up sticks and threw them in the tractor bucket and there were still so many sticks that it would bog up the disc harrow. The original plan was pasture um, for most of it and then leave that edge over there as kind of a supplemental food plot for deer. And we have a food plot in the back, but we thought, well, maybe we want deer up front. So we planted things that deer like to eat along the woods line there. So did iron clay peas. In the winter, I do rye, I do wheat, I do oats, I do clover. There's clover there right now. It's not a lot of grass, but what we, uh, what we discovered or we determined was as we built out the property that 
we probably want more pasture in the front and we probably want to deter the deer from being in the front because um, the camera right now is sitting on my the foundation of my, my parents' house and right immediately behind us somewhere, we haven't determined, they want a garden. Well, any of you that have tried to grow a garden where there's high concentrations of deer know that um, you're not going to have a garden. So now we've kind of changed plans and you got to be flexible with your plans. But we changed plans and we're going to plant the rest of the side of that in pasture and um, keep all and try to keep all deer activity in the back behind the camera. Again, this is the front 10 acres of our 20 acre property. And um, so that's the plan. So I'm going to kind of step away a little bit and you see the corner of the pole barn. Um, we refer to it as a pole barn, but that's Deb's barn. Um, the shed, the mega shed is mine. The pole barn is hers. Uh, for the most part, and uh, we're going to create animal stalls in there, and that's where she's going to have her animals, and they need to eat, so they're going to eat in this pasture. So we joke with each other that we we will have a house on this property. It'll be the last thing built on this property, but we will have a, a home on this property, but we joke between my love of critters and the barn of critters and his love of being outdoors and his mega shed that we're both going to kind of be living out here and the house is probably not going to get much use, but we will have one to, to curl up at night and sleep in. But as far as the pastures, what we're planning on planting in them, or what we planted in them, and we'll continue to plant as we fill in the areas that, that need to be replanted, um, it's Bahia grass. And it's spelled B-A-H-I-A. -I, -A. I probably don't say it correctly. I say it differently than the locals do. I think they say it something like Bahia. Bahir is what our um, land clearing guy called a Bahir. Yeah, I said, um, we're gonna, I'm going to plant some Pensacola Bahia out there. And he's like, what's that? And I said, that's that grass that everyone's plants in your pasture. I said, we were at your farm. We were at your farm. And you said you got Bahia out there. He goes, I don't have Bahia. I got Bahir. So, Bahir or Bahia. That's what we planted. But so far, I've been pleased with it. It, um, it spreads well. I've got a little hand spreader that I use for all my food pots for clover seed and little seed. And I walked all this, and, and Deb walked some of it too, um, five, six feet at a time, just spreading that seed so we could get a nice even coverage. Um, and that was after we had dissed it. And then I hooked up a um, either a round pole or a six by six and a piece of chain link fence, and I just drug it off. And that put all that little seed into the cracks from the disc harrow and uh, smoothed out a lot of the real rough places out there from the disc. The higher grass grows slowly, and it really helps to have some sort of nurse crop with it. I planted something called brown top millet, and brown top millet grows up quickly and allows the slower grown Bahia to establish its roots. So I got ground cover immediately and to help me with erosion, and then the Bahia is growing up behind it. And it's just, it's a nurse crop type of uh, situation, and that's what I use for most of this pasture to establish it. We had it hayed once last year, but it had already gone to seed. So there are a billion Bahia seeds out there because we let it go to seed. We weren't keeping it mowed. But if you keep Bahia closely uh, mowed, it'll become a nice, thick, lush grass. Then you can see that it looks a little, it's obviously closer to the ground, but it, it forces it to grow thicker, more like the grass that's at your house. Um, it's weedy right now behind us. We didn't have a chance. We were just busy with so many things this year. I wanted to keep it mowed to keep the weeds down. Then I decided to let it go to hay, and it is what it is right now. We'll, we'll keep working on that so we have that, that perfect pasture. Uh, this whole place is a work in progress. So we're entering the back 10 acres of the 20-acre property. First time I've seen this um, since the storm came through, and I see a pine tree ahead of me that's blown over. So as we were driving up here, we could see some trash alongside the road where trees had fallen over, but... Looks like we've had at least one tree was a casualty. Hurricane Michael came through about three years ago and this area didn't have as much damage, but there are still dead trees that are standing. So we believe that Fred came through and trees that were ill or dead, it's just knocked a bunch of them over still. I see a tree down in the back. Couldn't, couldn't handle the wind, I guess, but not too bad. And again. I'm not good at spinning. Yeah. The heat and humidity, you can see uh, sun's come back out. 
This is the one acre in the back that I also had to plant after it was cleared. And it was the same process. We did uh, had land clearing and we had box blading and we dissed it up. This has been planted multiple times because uh, we're going on our third year since it was um, since it was bulldozed and cleared. Planted sun hemp because I wanted to raise the organic matter in the soil. God, man, just got bit. And sun hemp is a real fast growing legume, but it's known as a soil builder. So I planted it out here because I wanted to enrich the soil with organic matter. It got really thick, grew very well. It's really hard to deal with after that. The, uh, as the name implies, hemp, which is used for rope, it bound up the disc arrow, it bound up the bush hog, and it was just real hard to till after that. But it, uh, it definitely added a lot of organic matter. So we mentioned how we planted Bahia wherever we, la we cleared land. And this is our back fence line. So I'm gonna swing around, so that behind me would be facing the east. I'm gonna swing around. Behind me is the food plot, and that would be towards the big five acre opening we were talking at. I'm gonna keep swinging around, and that up there behind me would be, <laughs> that up there behind me would be our, our west. The tractors really can't get back here to uh, bale the hay. So I keep this mowed pretty close to the ground so it stays nice and thick. But as for erosion control, there's a pretty good grade that goes from behind me to in front of me and uh, water go, will flow down here. When we first bought the property, it was very rutted. It was eroded really bad. There was probably three foot, two foot, three foot trenches out here from the water erosion. And we've stopped all of that with this Bahia grass. But we wanna wrap this up on this Northern half of our pasture. So you can see I got this mowed trail that goes over to our East fence line. And what we're gonna talk about is this four acres or so right here. These four acres behind me are a little bit of contention within the family here. I wanna cross fence it and maybe grow some cattle. And we showed you the food plot in the back, maybe turn that to Bahia grass, and then maybe have like five acres, five different places we could move, do some rotational grazing with cattle. And then every fall, uh, send one to become uh, our dinner for the following year. That's um, where that's where the contention comes in. It's not with the cross fencing. It's not with the different areas for feeding. It's with the making uh, one of my critters food. So I'm a meat eater. I respect the meat industry. I'm not. I'm not hating on it. But I don't think I can raise something and then have it for dinner. My food now does not have a face associated with it. So it that. There's a little bit of a difference there for us. Yeah, Deb, Deb definitely understands farm life, even though she didn't grow up on a farm. I think we've come to a compromise. Again, we've got three and a half years or so to figure this out, but I think we've come to a compromise where I can run some chicken tractors on the pasture behind me. Um, we're still gonna debate the cross fencing for cattle, but uh, as a minimum, we'll get some chicken tractors. I know, I'm fairly certain that if I take care of the chickens that um, Deb won't have a problem with eating them. She does love her some chicken. Well, I guess that's a wrap. I'm going to go uh, find some shade. I'm melting. You got anything you want to say, Deb? You tied it all up beautifully. All right. Good deal. Well, y'all take care out there and uh, we'll see you on the next one. Take care.